this anticipation. Hope you're in the right session. This is app 202, okay, an absolute beginner's guide to Windows 8 apps. We had to drop the with SAML and C Sharp off the end there because um, it was running off a little bit. Um, why, let's quickly tell you why this session is awesome, then I'll tell you a bit about ourselves. Um, this session is going to be incredible because it's about Windows 8, and I can see the popularity in the room uh, because of the popularity of Windows 8. Hands up, who's done development for Windows 8? Okay, that's good, because it's a bit of a beginner's guide, so you guys may get, not get too much out of it, we'll go for there. So absolute beginners, there's no stupid questions, only, um, no, I won't say that. Um, so do raise your hands, do, do come and ask questions. We'll be around afterwards, we'll also be around at the um, Nokia stand in the um, lunch area afterwards as well for, for questions. Um, we'll you know, handhold you through what we're doing. Um, lots of useful tips and tricks that we've come across while developing for Windows 8, and heaps of links in the first part of the presentation at least. So um, the presentation will be online later on to download, or we'll come and grab it off a USB stick afterwards as well. So who are we? I'm Ian Randall. <laughs> I'm Ian Randall. So I, um, I blog on Tamil.geek.z, I'm Kiwi Palm on Twitter. Um, I'm slightly obsessed with angle brackets, and I recently joined into my metro. Yeah, and I'm Ben, and at NZ Ben on Twitter. Uh, I call myself a recovering manager, but I'm, I'm a coder. I've, I've managed for a few years and realized that coding is what I loved more, so I do that. Um, been around the traps, all the various large companies around the place, and also now with Marker Metro. So Marka Metro, um, we are a small team uh, of guys that all we do is Windows Phone and Windows 8 apps. So we just do Windows apps, focus 100% on it. So what are we going to show you in this session? The first part of the session will be a Windows Apps Design 101, stuff that you need to know, rules you need to follow to make great Metro apps, make great Windows 8 apps. Um, I think there was a session on this earlier on. What we're going to do also is drill down into some of the um, specifics of design in XAML and the specifics of design uh, in code as well, so the things you have to take care of as opposed to the concepts. And then Ian's going to, <laughs> Ian's going to cover Development 101, so show you some actual codes. Uh, some actual angle brackets and bits and pieces behind there. So let's kick into design straight away. Hopefully a lot of you have seen this. Who's, who knows the, the principles of great Metro apps? Oh, okay. All right, so I'll go through them in a bit more detail. Actually, who doesn't know the, the principles of great Metro apps? Cool, that's good. Just making sure that all of you have arms. <laughs> good, good. Um, so. These principles, I'll go through them in detail, but there, there's a core gui a set of guiding principles around writing good Metro apps. I'm going to keep saying Metro because to me, Metro still speaks to the design language, the look and feel of Windows 8 apps. Okay? So the, the things we're building, the, the trademark is Windows 8 apps, the design language we use is, is Metro. And I don't think there's anything wrong with using that word when we're talking about the way they're laid out on screen as opposed to some sort of system that they run under. Okay? So I'm going to go through these one by one. The first one is talking about craftsmanship. Um, when I think of craftsmanship, I think of um, a guy with a, a lathe and a, and a little um, chisel being very, very careful in what he's doing and very um, creating beautiful things and objects that are useful. And he takes pride in his work. He or she, they take pride in their work. And they, they like to produce things that are great to look at. They don't um, cut corners. You know, they, they leave the corner cutting to the perhaps the IKEAs or the or the companies you know the, the, the companies around the world that sell to the warehouse this sort of thing right so I've got I've got a set of drawers at home one is um, from the warehouse the other one is hand built and the, the difference is amazing you can, everyone knows this and so when we're talking about craftsman, craftsmanship and metro apps we're talking about hand built taking careful care but also following a set of rules a set of well known rules that are that are in place just like the master master craftsman will. Even if his piece is completely unique, if he's building a set of drawers or building something where he's putting wood together, he'll use dovetail joins. Okay? And they'll be behind the scenes where no one can see them, and they might have a tiny touch of personality to them, but they're the same as anyone else's dovetail joins. They're exactly the same. And that's because that's the best way to put two things together, two pieces of wood together on an angle. So just like that, in the metro land, we have rules we follow, even if we're designing something completely unique. Does that make sense? So the rules in Metro are come in a few, few flavors. It was the grid, the font ramp, 
and some things about the snap and the scale. You saw me playing with um, the apps at the beginning, hopefully, and I was doing snapping of the apps to, to different sides of the screen. So the rules in Metro, the rules in Windows 8, uh, relate to the size of that snap view, the fact that you have to do a snap view. Okay. I'm going to go into these in, in detail again so you can see what we're talking about. Um, hands up, who knows what that is? A square? <laughs> you guys said you were beginners. <laughs> uh, that is a square, but I'm also going to say that's a pixel. I'm going to say this is one pixel in Metroland. <laughs> What's that? A grid? Okay. In Metroland, this is one subunit. Five by five pixels is a subunit. Okay. So when you're spacing anything on the screen, you space five pixels, ten pixels, fifteen pixels, and no other spacing. That's the rule, or I'll come down there and I'll beat you. Okay. What's that? Yes, there you go. We're learning. We've learned something. That's a unit. So we'll go back. Pixel, subunit, unit. So a decent sized space in Metro is a unit, 20 pixels. Okay. And that's them in summary. This is the Metro grid. And you will learn it, and you will love it, and you will use it. Okay? This is like an army training course. And if you, you know, um, my boss, the Keith Patton, the CEO of Marco Metro, um, is a oh, what's a nice word? <laughs> he is picky, and if things are off by one pixel, he sees them, and we fix it. And that's what you should do when you're building Metro apps. If things are off by one pixel, don't just go, oh yeah, that's good enough. Fix it. You know, we either. Um, snap screenshots and draw lines on them with, with our you know, Photoshop, or we've been known to sit there with um, phones and a sharp edge and hold them on the phone just to see how things are going. And that's the sort of thing you need to do when you're a Metro craftsman. Okay? There's also tools you can use for that, uh, like grids to help you. So this is a summary of the Metro grid. And you can see that it's five units from the, sorry. Yes, five units on the top of the screen, and in from the left as well. I'll show you that in detail here. Okay. So five units to the bottom of the header, and then seven units to the, to the content. Okay. There you go. So you can see how the metro spacing, the metro units, apply to the metro screen. And you can start to see there what's coming together as an app, so that'll look familiar you've used Windows 8 at all. They all look very much like this. And that's for a reason. It's because they're on grid. Right. So I'm going to show you a little demo now of a tool we love to use as well. Sorry, this button. Work. Cool, cool. I'm just going to run up this app. So this app is just a, um, it's just a file new project. And the only change I've made to a file new project is add in a reference to a tool we call XamilSpy, or a tool that's called XamilSpy. You should grab XamilSpy if you've got any interest in doing Metro apps. It's like a, um, a DOM browser, if you're in HTML land, for XAML. Okay, it allows you to, to inspect what's going on inside the rendering of the page. But one of the cool tools it has is a little thing, you can't read it, but it's called Show Grid. Okay, and there you see that the file new project is perfectly on grid. Okay, so you, you guys at the other end can't see, but if you have a look, there is no pixel between the, uh, you know, the, the left-hand margin and the first grid object. Likewise, the baseline of the text is perfectly on grid, okay, each item here and here. So use XamilSpy, use tools. Like I say, if, you, if, you're, if you're really desperate, just get a piece of paper and hold it against the screen and have a look and see if you're on the grid. Yeah, question? Say again? Whereabouts? Oh, right, between, between objects, yeah, yeah. yeah. 10 pixels is, is a, a common. Um, so for hard edged objects, 10 pixels is a good spacing. For soft edged objects, you want to go a bit more, 20 or 40. Yeah. Yeah. Another question Good question. Good question. No, they're device independent pixels. Okay. So the metro grid will always be in device independent pixels. And so as you go to larger screens, Windows 8 will deal with that for you. And if you say, I want to space you know, by 20 of these things, that's why when you say put, put a margin, you don't say 20px, you just say 20. 
and that's 20 device independent pixels. And so on a larger screen, it'll be large, a larger space. Okay, but it'll all be proportional. Some interesting things there. Um, if you're um, going to attend ne this session at the same time tomorrow in the same room, we're going to go into a lot more detail on this, on the grid and how it works and how things, how things behave. Because you'll, you'll notice things like as I roll over these elements, the highlight is actually outside of the box, outside of the grid. So if you're doing a brand new metro project and you go file a new project, have a look, there'll be some weird numbers in there. There won't be 120, there'll be 117 and 116. And you need to understand why that is, and we'll go into that tomorrow, but it's a bit too, too deep for what we're going to do today. The reason for that is, is to deal with these highlights. Okay. So just summing up that the grid, okay, that's the question you had before. 10 pixels between similar elements or elements with hard edges. Okay, so those elements with backgrounds. You can go more if you think you need to for things. If you've got text that's uh, you know, left aligned and with a, rough, with a ragged right edge, you might put a bit more, bit more spacing in there. Um, four units or 80 pixels, that's the spacing between groups of units. Okay. There's a really good re reference. Again, this um, presentation will be online. You can get this stuff. The next rule in Metro is the font ramp. Okay. Don't be tempted to go and put bold and italics and 20 pixel, 40 pixel, you know, different, you know, different sized uh, fonts on the screen. Use this list of fonts. If you need to break out of this list of fonts at all, think really, really hard before you do it. It can be very restricting, but what you'll find is if you use just this font ramp, your app will look very Metro, it'll look very good. Okay. If you find yourself using intermediate sizes, uh, you'll, start to th you'll start to kind of tax the user and, and tax the user interface. Okay. Uh, Sego UI is the only, um, the only font to use. Okay. The exception to that is if you're going to replace the font across your entire app because you're going for a whole different look and feel. But otherwise, just stick to that font. Okay. Just a final thing on rules and craftsmanship is, um, is a great book called Dancing About Architecture. You should read it. It's actually a book about teaching. But um, the concept is that writing about music is about as relevant as dancing about architecture. And it's talking about thinking about things in different ways. And one of my favorite quotes from it is that if you just follow the rules, if you just follow all the same rules as everyone else, the best you can do is be as good as everyone else. So follow the metro rules but break the rules where you want to and where you need to to make your app look different and fantastic. Does that make sense? Okay. Fast and fluid. It's a laxative on the market. No, it's not. Fast and fluid is another Metro design principle. What does it mean? It means make things move on screen, make animations happen, make things come onto the screen one by one. All right? um, animations in Windows 8 XAML are quote unquote free. There's some great child animation things we'll show you in a sec. Um, responsiveness, if you were in Ivan's talk just before about async await, stay off the UI thread. Do everything in the background thread. Okay? Everything that is, takes longer than 50 milliseconds in Windows RT, or sorry, in WinRT, the runtime, is async. You cannot call it synchronously. So call those things asynchronously, let them do whatever they want on the background thread, then come back and update the UI. It even means doing things like some of the tricks we use when we go to a new page on the phone especially, which can be slow to even load user controls, we just wait for 25 milliseconds on a different thread. Go to the page, wait, and then carry on to everything else. And that lets the phone navigate, bring up the screen really fast with nothing on it, and then render everything. And just that little trick is enough to trick people into thinking the app's running fast. Okay? It is running pretty fast, but it makes it feel even faster. Um, we're going to talk more about async await in app 301, especially around exception handling. And you, if you'd seen Ivan's talk before, that was a good one to go to. Ian's going to do a little quick demo on how easy animations are in Windows 8. Okay. Probably should switch the screen. There you go. Here we go. So I've just. Everyone hear me okay? So the simplest of demos to kick, to kick things off. Um, what I've got is a very simple page. I've got a few um, things on it. It's just going to load up a few items on a screen. And let me just check that that's ready to go. Yep. 
and if I hit go, so you, it, it all happens pretty quickly, okay? So if you watch the screen, it's going to put those four things, put those four things up on the screen, okay? So we, when we talk about um, making our apps fluid and making them seem um, uh, more natural, and we talk about fast and fluid, we can do a very simple tricks like adding in animations. And as um, as a WPF developer, and um, when I think animations, I think triggers, and I think, mm, okay, I, I'm going to have to get my head around this. And certainly, we can dip into Blend, and we can look at all the the various ways of applying uh, animations. With uh, with Windows 8, it's actually it's actually pretty simple. So within the grid, I stop that. So within the grid, I'm just going to add in this um, property called Children Transitions. This describes the transitions that we want the children of our grid to contain. So I need to to create a collection, a transition collection, and within that transition collection, I can actually put the transitions I want to to run. And I'm just going to do an entrance theme transition. Now, this is pretty subtle. Again, you have to watch it first, I'll, and I'll, we'll improve it in just in a second. But you should just see a very, very subtle movement. Did everybody get that? Really subtle. Let's actually say that's a bit too subtle for me. So, go back here. And that entrance theme transition, I'm actually going to change that to come in from a horizontal offset of something like 350. And if I run that again, the transition's just that but more pronounced and make it more obvious. And you can tweak those numbers and play with those numbers to give the effect that you want. So actually adding animations to your screen is literally as simple as that couple of lines of code. And before I just quickly hand back to, uh, to Ben, I just want to point out the... Uh, it doesn't have to be a horizontal offset, it could be a vertical offset, and it doesn't have to be a positive offset either. It could be negative. So if this were a positive offset, it would go, um, it would travel up, but because we made it negative, the, the boxes travel, travel subtly down. Cool. Okay, so that's it. So there's lots of other um, free animations in there. You saw when Ian was typing, there was add remove, there's um, reposition, theme transition, there's all these built-in transitions, um, and they all, you know, if you've got a list box you're adding things to, you can actually have things add in one by one, all that sort of stuff. So have a play. Just go in there and fiddle with those animations and have a feel for your app and see, see what it feels like as you use them. Um, authentically digital is the next metro principle. So what does this mean? Um, a little bit of a... A sidetrack, but um, there's a, a quote from Marshall McLuhan, everyone probably knows the medium is the message. It was very um, popular back when, you know, soon after TV became incredibly popular. And it was the point that the, the, the medium of television was actually, ch you know, um, giving us information and changing the human race as, as, a, you know, as we watched it. Not just the content on the television, not just the TV programs and the advertisements, but the TV itself. Okay? That same thing is, is what's going on right now with the internet and with screens. The screen is our, is our medium, it's what we do as developers. And it's as, as important to, uh, this is, I'm not overstating this, as important to the human race as you know, the television, internet, everything else. When you're writing a line of code, you are influencing people. Okay? And you're writing it for a screen. You're not writing it for a leather-bound notebook. No, you're writing it for a screen. So when we say authentically digital, we mean Embrace that. Embrace the screen. Embrace the, the, the touch, the touch sensitivity, the mouse, everything else. And sometimes it's easier to show what's not authentically digital than it is to show what is. Okay? So these, this is the new calendar app in iOS and OS X rather. And um, I don't know how you feel about it, but the fact there's, there's stitching on there, there's fake tear off at the top, there's page curl animation when you change pages, is I think just going a little bit too far beyond what we do on our screens. It's adding stuff that's meant to make you feel like you're using a, a nice tear-off calendar, but it really just gets in the way in my mind. The same thing with Find My Friends app. There's, you know, it's actually wasted space to put that stitching there. That space could be used for content. So authentically digital is don't put fake things on the screen that, that, that don't exist in the digital world. 
okay? Don't use what's called skeuomorphism, which is trying to represent real world things in digital. You're on a screen, so behave like you're on a screen. The other things that means is use all of the screen. Don't put extra Chrome in there where you don't need it. They go right to the edges of the screen. You know that on Windows Phone, everything goes right to the edges. Same thing on Windows 8. Bleed off the edge to show people there's more information there instead of putting a scroll bar in and wasting space. Okay? You can be more efficient than a fake page turn. You know, a quick navigation to the next page gets the user to where they want to go faster rather than you know, a, a slow page curl. Does that make sense to everyone? Okay. Authentically digital. Use fonts and white space instead of putting Chrome on the screen to, to show, show where they can go next instead of taking up space. Okay. Which leads me on to do more with less, another metro principle. There's a com this point of content over Chrome. That's where we talk about using the grid, using the font ramp, and using spacing to denote where things are on the screen and what you can do next, as opposed to using Chrome with things like borders and you know, title bars, this sort of thing. You won't see those in Metroland. Okay? The other part of do more with less is fierce reduction of unnecessary elements. Okay? Think about what the user needs to do and only what they need to do and take everything else away. If they need to do it, you know, if there's a secondary action and it's one click away, that's OK. An example of that is um, an app we worked on recently um, for Plunkett. They had an iPad app that's in progress. And this is an example of the iPad app. And this is, you know, this is standard iPad and you know, healthcare app design. And I guess a few years ago, this looked interesting and sexy, and, and it's all iPad-like and new. But to me, it looks like it looks busy. It looks like there's too much information on the screen. When we redesigned it, we reduced the amount of stuff on the screen, okay? And we said, what is the most important thing to the user? Most important thing was appointments. You know, appointments aren't anywhere in that landing screen. So we brought those to the fore. Everything's there. You know, you can right click on the screen when you're running the app and you'll get a navigation bar and you can go anywhere else in the app. You can, you know, right click on things, you can tap on things, you can drag things around, you can semantic zoom. It's all there and it's all just as easy to use, but it's cleaner and it's, we've reduced the elements on the screen and it's easier to use. Okay. So it's a fierce reduction and doing more with less. So the app looks better, acts better, but it has less on the screen. Okay, the next, I think the final principle is win as one, which means be part of Windows, be part of the operating system. If you follow those rules, the font ramp and the grid, everything else, your app will feel like part of Windows and people won't be um, jarred by a transition to and from that app. And also if you use the facilities within Windows 8, search, you know, the, um, the share charm, settings charm, then you can actually it helps you get rid of stuff off your own app. You don't need a search bar anywhere in your Metro app at all. You don't need a search box in your app because the Windows 8 search will do it all for you and we'll show you that later on. Okay? You don't need a settings panel anywhere in your app okay? because the settings charm will, will, will invoke that for you. You don't need a settings button anywhere. Okay? And yeah, be consistent. Follow the rules. Accept where you should break them. Okay? So that's just a summary of Design 101 for, for Windows apps. So when you're thinking about writing an app, come back to these principles. Think, am I taking care with what I'm doing? Am I doing, am I looking for those one pixel offsets and fixing them? And if not, please do, you know? Is it fast and fluid? Is it responsive? Is it easy to get to the next page? Is it authentically digital? Do I have leather all over the place? Um, you know, have I reduced everything as much as I can and am I working with the platform? So, yeah. Now handing off to Ian. Take the next slide. Yep. So I thought long and hard about what slides I was going to present to you guys. Yeah, that's, that's probably enough. <laughs> so what I want to do um, in the first instance, I just want to take you on your first few baby steps in the, the Windows 8 platform. Has anybody actually done this? Has anybody fired up Visual Studio 2012 and hit File New and see, seen what comes out? A very small number. OK, so let's show you the rest of you what happens. Um, Actually, let's just fire up a new instance of Studio. So Visual Studio 2012, this is um, the release candidate running on the RTM build of, of Windows. This is all, this is all available. Um, 
and it ships with a whole set of new templates. So I'm assuming, we kind of said it was an absolute beginners to Windows 8, I'm assuming you guys are mostly devs, .NET developers? Yep, yep, okay. So you're familiar with hitting File New and getting a, a series of templates. How, how will I start my application? I'll, I potentially could choose one of these templates to get me going. Well, with the, uh, with the 2012 builds, we've, we've now got these extra Windows Store uh, application options that that I just want to quickly show you uh, what they look like. So, blank applications, as you'd expect, there's nothing there. The grid application is the one that, uh, that Ben showed you earlier. Uh, the grid application actually splits your, um, gives, you, gives you a couple of views where it has, um, can I zoom this here? So this view here, which actually gives you that high level grid view where you take a collection of data, put it into groups and you suddenly have a collection of grouped collections and you present those groups in this, this grid view here across, across here. Um, the template will also, it will also allow, give you some navigation that will allow you to sort of dive into those groups and see the items within it and it will even give you uh, an item view for each of those items within your group and it will spit out some dummy data that you can then swap out for your own data. Um, as you see fit. So that's that's the um, the grid app. The split app is a little bit a little bit simpler. It's very very similar, and it's just sort of splits that that list view here. It's like a master detail control. So you've got your sort of your master list here, and the detail on the right there. And again, you've got this this extra view here. So so um, when we actually when we actually fire an app up. Uh, the template is doing some work for us as, as we would expect. And the first thing that's, um, that's interesting, when, when Ben talks about using the, uh, the font ramp, and when he talks about following the rules and using, using the, the standard um, font sizes and, and, and so on, I haven't done anything, I've just literally hit File New, I've got this app, it's been written for me, and it's come with this file called Standard Styles. XAML. And within the standard styles, I've got, a, I've got a, a whole collection of styles. So one that's interesting, one or two that's interesting I just want to point out is we've got a header text style that comes with a specific font style, a subheader that comes with a specific, specific font value. So we can just tap into these, these standard styles by accessing them as static resources. Why aren't those sizes the ones from the front rim? Front rim are point sizes. These are dips, dips device independent pixels. So, yeah. So that's partly why you should use those, because you don't have to remember 26.667 dips equals, I think, 20 point or 12 point, whichever one it is. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a whole collection of styles that come, come for free. Um, the other thing I wanted to talk to you before we actually sort of wrote some code, I just wanted to show you what happens in the back of the app that gets uh, the application class that gets created for you. Um, I'm not going to go over this in too much detail but this on launched, this is our entry point for when the user has actually accessed our application via the tile in the start screen. So if someone's clicked on the tile, the control will come into this method. Okay? And the work that it's doing is based around this piece here called frame. Is this font size big enough? Can people see? Yeah. Now the frame is the thing that's going to allow us to navigate around the application. So it's going to give us a few methods like um, uh, go forward, go back, can go forward, can go back, and it's going to allow and, and also navigate. It's going to actually let us move from from this page to that page to that page and control that flow. It'll keep the navigation stack for us, so it, uh, and it allows us to, to to move back in that navigation stack. And so it's an important piece that we that we need as Windows 8 developers. We need to understand how this works. Um, the way that the way that navigate works. So if I just go further down, I reach the line of code that says, okay, I'm now ready to actually start my application. I want you to navigate to this main page. And by doing this, 
um, we actually pass in the type of the page that we want to navigate to and the frame will understand that that means it needs to go and spin up a new instance of that of that piece um, and it will pass in as a second uh, parameter here it will pass in any arguments we want to send in so we can just pass an argument in there and then in the back of the main page code we can actually access the parameter that got passed in. So this is this is how we can actually pass these parameters. Can you guys see that? So the parameter that we actually sent in is the second the second argument in that call to navigate. We can actually pass the state of our application around the various pages as as and when we need. Okay, I just run that. It's not a terribly interesting application. It's also quite dark. Um, ah, before I uh, before I make it light, I'm just going to stick a stick a text uh, piece of text in here. No, not that one. Cancel solution. Let's just check. Um, uh, stop. Okay. So I'm just going to put a text block in here. I'm going to give it one of those standard styles. Um, incidentally, productivity tip number one if you install ReSharper, you can control space that and it'll go find the static resource for you. text uh, okay so we, there we have we have light colored text on that dark background okay Ian that's that's not on grid it's not actually <laughs> on grid I'll show you that's another really app really which really is on grid <laughs> in just a moment um, okay so within Within the object, the, the, the application object, the thing that actually defines the application that, that we're running, we, we have the ability to set properties within, within the XAML here. And one of the properties we can set is the requested theme, and we can choose between dark and light. So switching that whole theme between make this a dark class compared dark app compared with making it a light one is as simple as just setting a property on the application object. So it's not like a phone where the system defines that. You can choose that. So the, the best thing to do there is, is um, when your app design is done, work out whether it's mostly dark text or mostly light text, then set your theme based on that, and then work from there. Yeah. And if since it's not on grid, thank you for the constructive criticism, Sorry, uh, Ben. Yeah. Uh, if I actually wanted to then go and design this grid uh, in in a in a better way, I can actually use. Uh, this little option here, which is just, just says show snap grid. Okay, so I can actually draw that grid here. The interesting little um, gotcha here is that these are four by four, not five by five. They're still, so, yeah, they're subunits, but they're not, yeah. They are subunits, they're useful as a reference, but they're not drawing the, the grid as, as per what the metro grid is. Um, but it's still, it's a handy tool that we, you can just. Um, Fire that up and uh, and use it to style your style your spacings. So the, those are I mean the units the twenty by twenty pixel uh, dip units, but they should be shown as yeah probably five by five. Yeah. Okay, so I want to show you uh, an app that's a little bit more along. So um, before I show you any code, I'll tell you what I'm trying to do. We, um, when you do a lot of public talking, when you, when you write a lot of code to show people, you tend to have your own personal favorite APIs to call to get data and show. And I'm, I'm, I like hitting the Stack Overflow data API because it's, it's free and it's JSON and it's easy. Um, ben likes cover, color lovers because he loves colors. Yeah. Um, 
So the point of this app I'm going to show you is I'm going to hit a service on Stack Overflow and say, can you give me the top 30 users, please? And it's going to spit some JSON data back. I'm going to turn that JSON into, into user objects, and I'm going to throw them up on the screen. OK, so it's a pretty simple app. OK. Just, I'll just show it you running. So is that on? Is that on grid, Ben? I don't think. Uh, I think the ti title is, but not the rest of it. Yeah. Okay. So this is the first thing that we've done. We've gone to the we've gone to the service. We've got some data. It's turned it into a user object, and we've thrown it up on the screen. Now, obviously, that's not terribly useful because we don't know which users they are. So the next thing I'm going to show you is the concept of, of templating. So each one of the, uh, the users that you can see up on the screen, that's an item. And all we need to do is to define an item template to describe, based on the properties that we've just, just found from the API, describe how we want to present that data on the screen. So if I go into the uh, users page, it's a pretty simple page. I'm going to close that. Okay. So the code here should be familiar to you based on the previous uh, the previous demo. We've got an entrance theme transition going on. This is where we have our seven units. Each unit is twenty logical pixels, so we actually have 140 pixels of, of, of logical pixels of depth in the top row. We're going to stick a grid up in the top row, and the uh, the left-hand column of that grid is going to be six units, or 120 logical pixels across. So this is where we're following the rules, spacing out the title as per per what what we uh, what we want. Okay, and I'll skip down to the grid in the in the lower row in the second row which is zero index so it's it's index one um, and I've just dropped in a list view and this is the control that's going to list out the items that we find from our service okay so here's our data template here's our item template it's being described by a data template obviously that's not terribly interesting so I'm going to uh, I'm going to bore you all senseless by Typing this in. No, I'm not. I'm just going to paste it in. Okay. So we now have something a little bit more interesting around um, around a data template. Now, there are. Ah, so, how did I how did I come up with a template like this? I was going to ask you that. <laughs> how did you come up with those numbers one ten by four eighty? I'm really glad you asked me that, Ben. <laughs> <laughs> so, I. To, to come up with a, a sensible template for your for your data, for your grids to make it work for you, again, it's the same consistent message. Go back to the standard styles and see what it can do for you. So if we go back into the standard styles uh, XAML, and we can start looking for um, templates, and it's got some templates in there. Uh, template's probably a bad thing. Template. Let's look for, uh, is it data template? Yeah. So here's, this is a, a 250 pixel square item template. It's grid appropriate. Okay, so this, this is an example of a, the sort of template we could use. And I knew that for the shape of the, the, the result that I wanted, I actually uh, wanted this 500 by 130 item template. So I've literally copied, copied this data template and where this is binding to properties that it expects to see on the sample dummy data that it ships in the template, I've just swapped it out for properties that I expect to see in my model that I've, that I've just mm. grabbed out of Stack Overflow. Is this all making sense for people? The other way you could do it is, is make a view model that has, has image, title, subtitle, description in there, but that's a bit, you know, it's a bit prescriptive, so copy and paste if you need to. So I'm going to run that up. And 
hopefully we'll see that um, we've now got some names and some faces and some some reputations. Oops. Okay. Okay. Does that all make sense? So the next um, the next thing we're going to talk about is uh, async and await. So was anybody in the previous session? Yeah. You guys are going to follow this one. It's much, much easier. Um, I've got on the back end here, um, I have an asynchronous method called search async. No, I don't. Users page view model. Let's go to the users. Use page view model. Enough. Load users async. Okay. Okay. So the logic that we're following here is we have a collection of users. It's just um, it is an observable collection. I'm setting a flag called is, lo is loading. Okay, so the setting that flag on and off is going to activate the uh, the progress ring that we saw the control that we saw. That's just the standard control that comes comes with uh, Windows 8. Um, I'm creating a task. I'm calling this a awaitable this asynchronous method from from some service and bringing it back as a task. And when that task actually comes back, I'm writing this continuation here, passing the task in, and then going ahead and doing this piece of work here. Okay. So if anybody's done any programming with the Task Parallel Library, uh, this should be familiar. Okay. But as was mentioned in the uh, previous session, we can actually simplify this with with Windows 8 and with Win, with WinRT, with C Sharp on WinRT. Okay. So in order to, to make the, this thing do the same thing, I'll tell you what I'll do is I will uh, I'll copy it and then just just leave it here so we can see what it used to look like. Okay. So in the first instance, I'm going to decorate this class with the async keyword. Now an important distinction to make is that this is not telling the compiler that this is now an asynchronous method. This is telling the compiler, hey, heads up, because you're going to need to split the following code out into pieces. And the pieces are going to be the code that I want to, you to run um, on some other part of the system, on some other um, background thread, and the code that I want you to run later when that task finishes and it loops back into this method. So it's setting up like a little state machine. You're going to call into this method a couple of times, the first time to kick it all off and the second time to carry on. Okay? So it's exactly the same as the TPL version with the continuation. All right? And the way that we, um, we actually do this is with the await keyword. So I can get rid of that. And now, in fact, I'll come to this in a minute. I'll make it go, get rid of the red. Now that we're awaiting this call, the thing that's going to come back is no longer a task. Okay, so the compiler's going to take care of that for us. It's going to strip out the, the taskiness which I think is the way Ivan described it in the previous session. It's going to strip all that away from us so that we don't need to worry about um, continuations on that task. It's going to simply say, well, you wanted this thing to return a user collection. So we can assign the user collection to the result of that awaited call. And then we can just carry on with our flow, and suddenly it looks a lot more logical. If I get rid of that. And hopefully you agree with me that that actually reads a lot nicer than, than the, the TPL version. 
it looks like it's operating sequentially. But in actual fact, the compiler is sending you off to other places to do other pieces of work whilst keeping the UI thread responsive. That's, that's really important. Does anyone have any questions about async and await? Right. So the question was, if you put a method in where? Uh, after the pause, After this one? Oh, if you if you if you do something after here? Yeah. So by the time you've hit here, you're you're running synchronously, but you're in the second run through this. You've done the background work and you've come back into this method. Phones are off. That's the aliens. You've come back into this method, and the code is running synchronously. Um, okay, so it comes in here, does this work, and it does this work. It then sets about doing this work and returns control back to the thing that called it. Yeah. So the UI has called this method, and it now has control. It's done the first two lines in, in a few clock cycles, and it's set about doing this. this um, just imagine the bit I'm pointing on the screen this work here. So if anything, if anything w was called after load users async and whatever was calling it, that will now carry on because you're not waiting on that. So that means the UI, scrolling, responsiveness, all that sort of stuff will, will carry on while this thing is, is doing its bit on the background. Okay. I was going to ask Ian, what happens to um, exceptions inside this method, Ian? So, <laughs> exceptions. <laughs> that might be, that maybe might be for tomorrow's session. There, there, there is, there is um, more detail than I was going to go into in just in this little bit of the demo. But um, with the async await keywords, exception handling is um, is again, it's quite intuitive. We can wrap this call in a try catch block, and the exception that gets thrown within the service .load users async uh, method will get bubbled up to, to us, and we can catch that exception within this block of code here. So the, um, the session this time tomorrow, 11th try tomorrow, we go into that exception handling in a bit more detail because there are some gotchas. Yeah, so uh, you know, if we were calling this void method and saying just go off and, and do your thing, then yes, we've got a problem. If it throws an exception inside there, we don't catch it inside there. So yeah. So, um, so that's async await in 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 a five minute nutshell. I hope you can see that there's there's a whole heap more for you guys to to get in, dig in, and investigate around this. Um, and and we so I would suggest you come come this time tomorrow. Hey, question over there. The question was: Does it make sense to return any value after the await keyword? Uh, so, so what we're doing with the result of the await, the user collection, is we're doing work with that. So. Uh, the load users async does have a return value of task of user collection, and then we're going through those users and adding them to our own, uh, to our user's collection, which is, what is the user's collection there? It's, so the user's collection is the observable collection that's in the view model that the, the view binds to that user's collection. Anything we put in this property, this user's property here, this is going to show up on our screen. Does that answer your question, sorry? Basically, if you have oh, right. keyword, can you have anything that is employed? Yeah, so I mean... Oh, in yeah. terms of return types here. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, okay. So what, what could you return from this method? Well, let's look at this one, which is also an awaitable uh, method. I just go to the implementation of that. This is a task of user collection, okay? So if it's an async method, it needs to return... If it needs to not have a return, it's either void or it needs to return some kind of a task. And that task can be a generic task, so you can uh, return a task of string or int, or in this case, user collection. Yeah, so I think in a more complete application rather than demo application, you would be doing, so getting users and adding them to the screen is kind of a, you know, it works or it doesn't work. And if it doesn't work, you probably want to send a message, you know, maybe set a message somewhere or set an event that's going to say to the UI, to the user, something's gone wrong. Okay, so you might want to do that on a return, 
or you might want to do it via a messaging infrastructure or, or something else. Okay, so I'm going to move on. I've got one more demo to do, and we uh, hopefully will get a bit of an early breakaway for lunch. Yay! Um, the last thing I'm going to do, we, we talked about win as one, and what does win as one mean? It means giving our users, the users of our application, giving them a real consistent experience with the Windows platform. Now, I've been using Windows 8 for uh, a, a month or two now. Um, ben and the rest of the Market Metro guys have been using it for longer than that. And I can tell you, it genuinely, it takes you a day or two to completely get your head around the way it works. And, and any hysterics you might have heard about there not being start buttons is, is instantly forgotten. And you, get, you get, really get used to the way that Windows 8 works. For example, you're, you're in an app, you're looking for something. So we're in our Stack Overflow user app, but we're interested in more than just the top 30 users. We actually want to go and find uh, the bloke called Bob or the, the girl called Jane. Okay. So there's no reason for me to create some specific search panel for, for, that, for that requirement. I don't need to create a, 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 an explicit page that has search boxes and search buttons because that UI already exists in the Windows platform and all we need to do is hook into it. I think someone's leaning on the, um, the light switch. They could, be doing it. Session. they could be doing it for fun. <laughs> <laughs> so the first thing we need to do is go into the, the manifest here. Um, and the, the manifest contains a bunch of stuff. The thing I'm going to show you first is, the, just now, is the declarations tab. Is that, again, is that font big enough? Can you see that? So three tabs across the top here, application UI, capabilities, and we've gone into declarations here. And I'm going to add a search declaration. I'm going to hit add, and I've now made my application search compatible with Windows 8. It literally was that simple. That means that if anybody were to perform a search in Windows 8, it will now call into our application code. It will call into this app. And that will also cause, cause your app to show up on the list of searchable applications. Okay. And what happens with that list of searchable applications is the more you use them, the more they come to the top. So if you're building an app for someone else who has an important brand, then tell them about this because basically it means anyone, anytime anyone searches, they get a, you know, an eyeful of the, of the brand down there, the icon. Okay. So earlier on, we, we highlighted the on launched code. Now, this is the code that gets run when, some, when the user hits the tile on the start menu. What we want to do is launch the code when the user's searched in from Windows 8. So it's a different override. And all we need to do is. I'm going to override the on search activated method. And I'm going to um, steal the code from the on launched code there and paste that in there. But it's subtly different. When we launch the app, we go to our main page, and it's the page with the big buttons that's, that's apparently not on grid. This, this page, we want to launch straight into the users page, go straight into the users results page. So when we tell the root frame to navigate, don't tell it to go to the main page, tell it to go to the users, yep, the users page. And the parameter that I'm going to pass in is going to be the query text from the search. Okay, so it's as simple as that. When we when Windows calls into our application via a search, it's going to pass in these search event args. Within those event args, it's going to contain the query text, the text that the user just typed before they hit the search button. Okay? And as luck would have it, I've actually taken that parameter and actually passed that through to the user's page model, and that's going to activate the... It's going to go all the way through to the call to the API to say, find these users. And if it's blank, it returns the top 30. And, and if I deploy that now, and if we put something in it, then it'll pass it all the way down, and hopefully it'll go find our, um, our users. So if I do a search, if I go Windows Q, it's going to bring up a search box for me. And we can look for developer Jane. Hopefully, that's going to find some Janes. No, 
<laughs> I did a live demo and it worked. <laughs> Clap. <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry. Thank you. <laughs> So, so the, que yeah. the question was, uh, if you've got different, different things you want to search, like users, stores, or maybe even Stack Overflow users and questions, is the search smart enough to deal with that? The, answer, the flat answer is no, it's not. So you have to do that yourself. An example we've done in one of our apps is um, searching by birth date. So we try parse the incoming string as a date. And if it is, then we search by birth date. If it's not, we search by name. So the other way to do it is to um, provide a settings panel that says, what's your default search? and come in and then in the search page have a, a, a switcher to switch between other searches. So it's not great, but if you wanted to, I mean, you could, you could create a um, Google-style context, you know, Google-style um, prompted search, so they could say two colon whatever, um, which works in the mail app, or you could say stores colon something, rather than you can deal with it inside your app if you want to, yep. Context? Mm. So, Again, that's, that's up to you on that launch, on that um, search, on search activated thing. You're, you're in your app now. So you can then look at the app and say, what's currently going on? Am I on this page? You could probably do it that way too. Yeah. Yeah. You could inspect the frame and say, what frame is loaded? And yeah, it's all up to you. The, the other thing to call out is that you don't actually have to have the app running to be yes. able to activate the search. Now, it was in that case, but it doesn't have to be. The, the Windows is going to call into your app at that entry point, whether the app happened to be running previously or not. Any way to do auto, sorry? Auto complete, yes. So um, there's a second um, type of search activation, which is search suggestion requested, I believe. And then that will, um, so I think, we got a nap on there, seven, did seven digital do it? <laughs> I think it does. Um, I haven't got it on here. No, no but what that'll do is it'll, um, it'll ask you for some up to five search results, and you can insert those, and it'll show up below the search box. And you can, it'll ask you for, yeah. there we go, yeah. So the search, the autocomplete on the right? Oh, right. So as I'm typing, Eric Clapson turns up. Okay, so so I happen to download this album, but I haven't I haven't searched for Eric Church or Eric Prince or whoever these people are. So that's doing server side searching in 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 the autocomplete there, just as I'm typing. And all the highlighting, the highlighting is all automatic as well, I believe. So. It's another type of launch, and when in that launch you get an um, object which has search suggestions, and you can just add to that list, and that's all you do. And Windows renders them, Windows will, you know, you can add an image, you can add two lines of text, it does it all for you. Got a question here? No, so... Okay. So the so question, here, sorry, the question was for anyone who didn't hear it. The question was, did that mean in Windows 8 every search I do will be hitting Facebook? No. Yeah. Yep. So, yeah. so at the moment, this search is happening on the Seven Digital Music Store because that's what's that's what's here. I could run that same search against people, and it won't find anybody. Finance, it won't find so, anybody. So when when Ian when Ian clicks those other applications, it fires an event into the application. So it's a really important important question. <laughs> there you go, Eric. Oh, well, there you go. So um, this is a really important feature, and it's also important for security. And all of the, way, the way all of these contracts work, this whole winner's one thing, thing works, is it's a very, very slim layer. It's basically just text that goes back and forth. And it's up to you what lines of code you want to run, what security you want to apply, whether you want to hit the web, all of that stuff within your app. So you have full control over what you do with that, with that search query. And if you've got Facebook app installed and you never click on it in that search thing, then Facebook will never know you're searching for anything. It's only when you click on those search items that it will invoke the app, and Windows doesn't know anything about that either. So, yeah. Does that make sense? That answer your question? Yeah. Cool. We've got like one more minute. Last question, anybody? Yeah. You, yeah, I, I don't know the exact answer to the question whether it's website, but the fact is that, that it's the same font that's used in the um, HTML side of Windows as the XAML side of Windows. So I'd like to think it is. 
Um, I don't know whether I mean, it's included on Windows. It'll probably be a, a I mean, it, it won't be included on Mac, so yeah. So Keith's down the end there. Right. So if you can't hear Keith, he's saying no. The answer is no. Um, but we use Proxima Nova, which apparently is close enough for web. Yeah. Um, I've got a few Marco Metro t-shirts here. They're, they're small larges, if that makes sense. They're larges, but they're for small people. Um, so any other, <laughs> any other questions? They're for small people? <laughs> Let's put it this way. I'm almost a 3XL in these shirts, and I'm normally about a 1X or 2. So, yeah. um, so I'll give out a couple of some good questions, but any more? Is it possible to search across multiple apps? Is this a shirt? Yeah, uh, not at the same time. So you're going to be clicking between them. Yeah. yeah. Can you use other languages? Uh, yes, so uh, VB and C sharp are supported, and dot in the dot net language is F sharp. I'm not sure. Yep. 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 So you can. So you can. Uh, the question is, can you use other languages? Does it have to be C sharp? The answer is no. You can use um, underneath the XAML layer. You can use a dot net like language like VB or um, or C sharp. You can use. I think you can use F sharp. You can definitely uh, use C plus plus under XAML. Yep. Um, alternately, you could put, a, um, you could put a, a, an HTML layer, and underneath that, you could write your app in JavaScript. And it would all render as an app on the Windows 8 platform. Yeah. So we're on, on time. Um, I'll, I'll give these shirts to a couple of guys who asked good questions before. We'll be at the Nokia stand right now. You can come and talk to us now. We'll be over at the Nokia stand in the, in the marketplace. And otherwise, thanks. Thank